to be uh, just welcoming everyone. And I do have a very dear friend that I'm going to ask to really um, host today's presentation with Congressman Greg Stanton. So first of all, I, I just want to wish everyone a great week. Welcome back. We, we were, of course, as many of you know, off for the holiday of Passover. And I hope everyone did have a beautiful holiday, uh, whether it was with family or with friends through Zoom and family through Zoom, however you were able to celebrate this year. But I know that it, it definitely looked a lot different than last year in a, in a, in a positive way. So we're, things are looking forward and we're really excited about that. I wanted to introduce today a dear friend, somebody who is very active in this community. Her name is Karen Nagel. She is someone who, um, in addition to her community work, when I say community work, I say the Jewish community work. She also does a lot of volunteering and good uh, supporting many, many different institutions and causes throughout the state. And her and her husband, Robert, are the managing partners of Nagel Law Group. And if you do not know Karen Nagel, I know that she loves meeting people in person when that's safe. And one of the things that she has taken on recently is an additional role, and that is actually a judge in the Paradise Valley community or, or town. So she is someone who I value her time, I value her friendship. Uh, she has two beautiful children who are also um, exemplary young adults and also doing good. And she is going to be moderating today's discussion with Congressman Craig Stanton. So thank you all for joining us today. And Congressman, thank you very much for your uh, time today and your presentation. I'm going to start. It's an honor to be here. It's great. Thank you. Thank you, Levy. Um, there's nothing that makes me more for Clint than thinking about my family and you're talking about my children. So thank you for, for saying that. Um, I just want to introduce Congressman Stanton for some people who might not know so much about him. He has worked tirelessly for, fam for Arizona families since the year 2000, when he started his nine-year tenure on the Phoenix City Council. In 2012, he became the mayor of Phoenix and served in that capacity for six years, focusing on building our economy, innovation, and trade. He has worked to garner bipartisan support for investment in the biosciences, higher education, small businesses, and as mayor, he worked on one of the most ambitious transportation initiatives in the country. It was the voter backed plan to extend our light rail bus service and improve thousands of miles of roadways. In 2018, the Congressman was elected to fill Kirsten Cinema's seat representing Arizona's ninth district, which includes Tempe, parts of Phoenix, Scottsdale and parts of Chandler. While in Congress, He's focused on what is best for all Arizonans, including increasing trade opportunities, planning for our water future, investing in public transportation, um, and infrastructure. In Washington, he's part of a new Democrat coalition, and this goes to the question of whether he's a Republican or a Democrat. There's a coalition of 100 forward-thinking Democrats who are committed to economic growth, innovation, fiscally responsible policies and generally challenging unproductive divisive political methods. To that end, he is co-chair of that group's healthcare task force, which works on healthcare solutions, such as stabilizing costs and providing healthcare, um, making it more affordable to people. He also works on matters of great national importance and security and near and dear to my heart is including bipartisan support for the state of Israel. He's been to Israel two times, first on an official trade mission in 2004, and next on the American Israel Foundation trip in 2019. His voting record is a real-time testament to his pro-Israel positions, including co-sponsoring the resolution opposing BDS, the US-Israel Cooperation Enhancement and Regional Security Act, expanding medical partnerships with Israel Act, and also the resolution supporting the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and the UAE and Israel and Bahrain. So in general and in some, it's fair to say that Congressman Stanton is a real mensch. And I, for one, am grateful I've come to know him. 
I feel that he represents our state with grace, compassion, intelligence, and integrity. So on that note, I'm going to ask the congressman if there's anything you would like to say before I begin our kind of Q&A. Yeah, I want to say thanks. What a great introduction. That's so nice. I appreciate it. It's great to be back with Smile on Seniors. And Karen, thanks for your friendship and leadership. And most of you know me as the recovering mayor of the city of Phoenix. And I really loved my work uh, serving the communities all over Phoenix. And one of the things I needed to bone up on when I became a Congress member was pro-Israel policy. And you've been one of the leaders in the community that have really educated me and made me a stronger member of Congress as we do all we can to support our most important ally, particularly in the, uh, in the Middle East, Israel. You've done a really good job in that regard. And I think uh, that record that you just said about being so pro-Israel is in large part because of your education of me and leadership, et cetera. And Rabbi, I just want to say thanks for being such a good friend to me through many years and uh, multiple community events and all of the great things that you do for uh, for our community. And so um, it's really an honor to uh, to be here. And I just say, look, I'm in, I'm in the eye of the storm right now. I serve on two important committees, the Judiciary Committee and then Transportation and Infrastructure. On the Judiciary Committee, we have oversight and we, we have certain policy issues that are in our jurisdiction, things like civil rights, voting rights, gun safety uh, uh, legislation was in that committee, immigration, all the immigration changes that are going on. All of those are some of the hottest issues in Washington, D.C. right now. And then I also serve on transportation and infrastructure. That's really based on my experience as uh, mayor, because I'm really into building Amer building cities across America like Phoenix. And obviously, the president has put forward a pretty big infrastructure plan. And we're going to be noodling over that for the next uh, 60, 90 days, maybe even uh, beyond, as we try to put together an important investment. Layer on top of that, just a couple weeks ago, we passed the largest recovery plan in American history, the American Recovery uh, uh, Plan, which I believe is a very important plan to make sure that we support this country during these incredibly difficult times during the pandemic. I know there's a, you know, with the, the stock market doing well, that sort of masks a lot of challenges that are really happening across uh, America, facing American families. And I, you know, I look, um, many of you are too young to remember the uh, recession in 2008, nine. Uh, but if you do remember that recession, it lasted too long because I believe like, I believe Congress didn't do enough to support the American people and the American economy. And when, when a recession lasts years longer than it needs to, we're holding families back, we're holding people back. And so we're erring on, we're spending a lot of money and we can certainly have that conversation, but we're gonna err on the side of trying to do all we can to support the American people, American families during this uh, time. For example, the child tax credit, which is gonna reduce child poverty in America by 50%. Uh, so important that we, uh, that, that we support American people, American families. So that's all, you know, there's a lot going on. It's a busy time. Um, I'm really like you, uh, Rabbi and, and Judge Nagel, I'm really believing that we can get to the other side of this pandemic in the pretty near uh, future if people continue to behave properly in terms of taking the public health precautions. And once we get to the other side, I think we're going to, this economy is going to come revving back as it should in large part because uh, Congress has stepped up and, and done what we should do to prop up and support the American uh, people and economy. That's a lot that you you bit off, and, and we're glad you're there doing this this important work for us. Um, I'm sure that you've seen a lot of changes, as have many of us who have lived here in Phoenix for some time, specifically with regard to our own infrastructure. And I'm curious if you could offer your perspective on infrastructure and its value to us on a day to day basis. Okay, uh, look, here's the truth. Um, I want America, like everyone on this call, to be the strongest economy on planet Earth for as long as we possibly can, for generations and decades and hopefully beyond to come. American leadership is not going to happen by wishful thinking or osmosis. It's going to be really smart strategic investments. And that includes education and that includes infrastructure. 
Uh, and I frankly believe that we have not done enough in either of those critically important uh, areas. We're entering a new era, a new era of real tension with China, a real era of competition with uh, uh, China. Hopefully it could be a friendly competition, but it's a competition nonetheless. I want to win that competition, but we've got to do more to invest in ourselves. Fortunately, with infrastructure, um, it's good for, in the short run, job creation. It's good to help spur the economy. Uh, it, it improves people's quality of life, your day-to-day -day quality of life, if we do it the right way. And it helps us make our economy much more uh, competitive. So we're talking about the, the traditional infrastructure investments, roads, interstate, highways, bridges. We're talking about improving America's airports and our aviation systems, which still need to be improved. We're also talking about public transportation. If you've been a longtime follower of Phoenix politics, you know that I'm a passionate supporter in the importance of public transportation. Having grown up in a public transportation family, my dad sold shoes at J.C. Penney and at Park Central Mall in Central Phoenix, and he took the bus from our home in West Phoenix to Park Central every day. So as a working class family, we couldn't have made it without good public transportation. We need to keep investing in that. So that means light rail and buses and even bicycle infrastructure because bike, uh, bicycling is such an important part of a comprehensive public transportation systems. But we're also talking about broadband, high speed internet. Have we learned that through this pandemic, how important access to high speed internet for kids in the inner city, for education. I mean, you can't get an education these days unless you really have access to high speed, not just during the pandemic, although so many kids, there's gonna be a learning uh, disparity in large part because kids from lower income areas haven't had fair and full access to high speed internet for their education lessons. What about telehealth? Telehealth is gonna be an increasingly important part of how we deliver healthcare throughout uh, this country. Telehealth, in order to have real access to the opportunities of telehealth, you need high-speed internet. Internet. What about small business? If you run a small business, you want to be able to run it out of your home. And it's only fair that you have and right that you have access to high-speed internet. So we want to make sure that, you know, access to high-speed internet, probably most people on this call have that right now. But we want to make sure that kids in lower poverty areas, in rural Arizona, and our, our tribal communities all have access to high-speed internet. You know who does? Our competitor countries around the world. They, they're doing a better job of, of making sure that all of their citizens have access to high-speed internet. That's something the United States needs to do a better job on. And what about water infrastructure? This drought in Arizona is ongoing and it's gonna maybe get worse. Let's all pray for rain when we're done with this and pray for snow next winter. But in the meantime, we've got to prepare for ongoing drought conditions. The ability to move water, particularly non-potable water, uh, more efficiently so it gets reused. We, we water too many of our golf courses with drinking water. That's not acceptable in, in this era where we've got uh, uh, drought issues. We've got to do a better job with conservation. So moving that water more efficiently is, is really important for us to better manage uh, drought conditions in the desert southwest. That's got to be funded as part of the infrastructure plan as uh, as well. So a lot of big issues, you know, it's not inexpensive. So I, I don't want to be the first to, I'll be the first to acknowledge that infrastructure investment is expensive. Not investing in infrastructure is more expensive ultimately for the American people and the American economy. And so that's why I'm I'm so excited about what uh, working with this administration and getting the job done for the people of Arizona and the country on this most important issue of infrastructure investment. Um, fascinating. Um, on, a, on a separate topic, I know that you're very involved with regard to health insurance and many seniors, unemployed people, and people who have to buy insurance on their own find the cost prohibitive, um, as well as what's provided to them for the amount that they pay, perhaps not as, as full as they would like. What is or can Congress do to make healthcare more available and less costly to the people here? Sure. I mean, the first uh, is to make sure that no steps we take will ever reduce uh, Medicare and, and the support for Medicare in our system, including Medicare Advantage. I know I, probably some of the folks uh, on the call take advantage of the Medicare 
uh, advantage program. We need to do more with subsidies for you know cost sharing in the various exchanges. Uh, I don't know if some of the people on the call maybe participate in the Affordable Care Act. I do. I mean, that's the, I know people think that in Congress we get spectacular health care. The truth is that I'm on the exchange. My family is on the, the health care uh, exchange. And for people, it, it, and that can be very costly. Uh, so improving cost sharing subsidies to keep the cost of health care down for lower income families, working class families, and even middle class um, uh, families is an important part of our uh, system. And then of course, the big one, which is keeping the cost of pharmaceutical drug prices down. And I have supported, I, I made the pledge, I don't take any political money from any of the pharmaceutical companies. It's nothing personal, but um, we need to allow the federal government to negotiate for lower drug prices. That's something for a variety of reasons in, in times past, even when Obamacare was put forward, they put a restriction on the ability of government to use its purchasing power to better negotiate drug prices. Well, I, that may have made sense at one time. It doesn't make sense today. So we need to do, we need to use the full purchasing power of the federal government to negotiate much lower pharmaceutical uh, 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 drug prices. And then for those in the VA system, and if you are, thank you for your service to our country. If you're in the VA system, we've done a lot uh, recently with the VA uh, uh, Vaccine Act, expanding eligibility for COVID vaccine to all VA veterans, make sure there's no co-pays or out-of-pocket uh, costs. The American Rescue Plan will ease thousands of veterans' worries by waiving VA medical co-pays during the pandemic and speeding up VA compensation claims processing. So we're also focusing on support for our veterans and their health care during this uh, very, very difficult time. Do you, what type of healthcare questions does your office receive? Like if somebody has a question or an issue or a problem, can they, do they ever call your office and ask, or would it be a, VA, a vet or something about what they can do or if people have trouble getting a vaccine or um, getting on the exchange, does your office handle anything like that? Heck yeah, that's a part of what we do. I mean, uh, look, I bring a, you know, from a, the city world, I'm used to constituent service. I love constituent service. Uh, and I've got a great team that takes it very, very seriously. And, and so we're, we, we, we've built a pretty good reputation in a short time of being very responsive to people that interact with our office. And absolutely, um, uh, questions as it relates to Medicare and Medicare issues, social security benefits, if somebody is not receiving their fair benefits or they, have a question in that uh, that regard. Obviously, I get a lot of uh, comments about what I should be doing on healthcare and healthcare uh, uh, policy. Some think I should not be supporting the Affordable Care Act. Some people think I should be supporting a single payer system uh, in uh, as our healthcare system. So a lot of policy suggestions, and I listen to everybody. I mean, that's part of my job is to take it all into account as I make my important uh, decisions about what policies I'm going to support. Uh, in the in the uh, United States Congress and on the vaccine side, uh, my office has done a really good job. Maybe some of you are on our email list, but we've done a really good job of getting accurate and timely and easily digestible information to people. We have had literally thousands of people say that they got signed up for a vaccine because they got an email from my office shortly before the uh, a window opened for vaccine opportunities, and because they knew about that window they could click right on from that email and get signed up for the, uh, uh, for the vaccine process. You know, moving forward, obviously one of the main issues we're gonna be dealing with is vaccine equity. Uh, we need to make sure that everyone is get, has a fair and full opportunity to get the vaccine. Uh, that involves all of our communities of color, uh, our African-American community, our Latino community, our Asian community, our Native American community, because this is a public health crisis. And in a public health crisis and a pandemic, if one community is not getting the vaccine, it puts all of us at risk. So we all have a huge stake in making sure that we get this vaccine uh, shots in the arms to as many people as possible. So literally later on today, I have a big meeting with some of the key African-American leaders across the valley. And we're gonna do some real planning about how we can do more to, to kind of uh, uh, bridge that uh, brings that vaccine divide and make sure that all communities are are uh, doing what we can to get as many people vaccinated as possible. Um, it's just incredible. It, 
it's incredible. Um, can you, you know, many of us, many of us are worn down by partisan politics and, and by the divisiveness of, of, of politics today. But one bright spot I feel has been relatively consistent is bipartisan support for Israel. Why do you think that is? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, number one, uh, I think to anyone that that really follows issues as it relates to our ally in Israel, you realize, I have, that support for Israel, strong support for Israel, is not actually about Israel. It's about the United States and good, strong foreign policy for the United States of America. We need strong allies in that region. And Israel is, our, you know, in many ways, our number one ally, ally in the globe, period, but certainly is our number one ally and friend with shared values in the Middle East. And as the Middle East is a very difficult neighborhood, having that ally is really important to uh, America. So when we support Israel, not, not, not just defense issues and military issues, although that's really important, uh, but, but we help support their information gathering so we can, we can gain important intelligence about what's going on in the region. That is good for the United States uh, of America. But uh, Karen, as you and I have talked about previously, one of the things I really like to focus in on in terms of pro-Israel policy is supporting the Israeli economy uh, because there's so much incredible innovation going on, arguably pound for pound, maybe the most innovative country on planet Earth. And we want to benefit from those innovations. So, so supporting in a financial way, but also allowing uh, innovations that are developed in Israel to be tested in the United States, kind of you know, engaging in kind of proof of concept um, that's really good for our, our country as well. So it's not just really a support for military or defense issues, also supporting the people and the economy of Israel is also good American policy. And I think once you kind of dive in and, and really study, that becomes abundantly clear. And whether you're a Democrat or Republican, uh, hopefully you're not, you're, 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 you care about facts. And that's certainly a fact. Hmm. Um, could you tell us a little about your visits to Israel, what you experienced there, maybe a particular experience or? Well, I need to correct the record on something, Karen, because you, in my, in your introduction, you said I've been to Israel twice. You shorted me one trip. I have been lucky enough to be there three times. First, uh, when Mayor Gordon was mayor and I was a city council member, we formed a sister city relationship, Phoenix and Ramat Gan, Israel, which is right outside of Tel Aviv. And for uh, reasons that I don't even know to this day, Phil couldn't make the trip. So I was lucky enough to represent the city of Phoenix when we signed the official documents in, uh, in, uh, in Ramat Gan to form that relationship. And that was, I guess, in the early... I was on city council and Phil was mayor. So maybe the mid 2000s. So I think we maybe celebrated 15 years recently of that relationship. But an incredibly special moment occurred during that trip. Because if you're active in pro-Israel stuff in Phoenix, you know George Wise. Uh, George Wise is an amazing man. And uh, he worked for Phil Gordon actually uh, for a while. He went on that trip. And if you know the story of his family, it's really amazing that his family, his dad was an executive at Motorola. And at, and in the, at a time when there was a lot of pressure in the early, I think late, late six, early seventies, pressure not to invest in Israel, Motorola at the direction of George Wise's dad opened up a, a plant in Israel. So George Wise's dad is like a legend in Israel. And they have a forest named after George's dad. And we were able to go and with JNF plant a tree in George's family's forest in Israel. And I don't know, I, I've, never, I've only seen him do it once and all the time I've worked with George. He was crying that day. That was a beautiful day. And I'll never ever forget that moment. Now that was in the mid 2000s. Now, of course, 
more recently in Congress, um, the uh, American Israeli Education Organization, you know, they they bring as many Congress members as as willing to go. My wife and I were able to go on that trip. It was in 2019, and you know that that was a trip uh, in terms of seeing the immediate challenges facing Israel uh, uh, from uh, Lebanon and now from Syria and getting to those outposts that are like right there. I mean, you, I could throw a football to areas where people were, were uh, dangerous factions were looking to do harm to the people of Israel. So that is a sobering experience. And then of course, to meet with moms living near Gaza and you know they're trying to raise their families and they're under constant threat of bombs and uh, balloons that have fire in them so that you know that their potential crops or, or even their homes are at risk there to see the real immediate threats to them and these you know one of the great things about being there is you can talk to people and actually this is not a video or it's not a TV show that you, you actually talk to the human beings whose families and lives are at risk uh, just because of their where they're physically located that that obviously has an incredible impact on you. But then, um, maybe the most important, I'm going on and on, but what the hell, you asked the question. Uh, <laughs> you know, probably the most amazing thing that I, will stick with me is the Israeli Defense Forces. They got a chance to meet some of the young people, Americans that have joined the forces there. These people are like in their early 20s, are some of the most mature people that are overseeing hundreds of soldiers and they're only in their early 20s. And to have a chance to talk to them and just realize, my goodness, the, 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 the leadership that they're displaying at such a young age. So number one, on a, from a military perspective, because that's what we're investing in. You know, when, when we invest in, in Israeli defense, we're investing in those people. And those young people who are just just blow you away with their maturity and strength and 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 uh, how what they're already doing at such a young age. They're the same people that those Israeli tech companies are recruiting after they get out of the military, and they already have the built-in leadership skills. And that's kind of the secret sauce, probably, as to why the Israeli economy, you know, is such an incredibly innovative economy, because the very skills that make you a great leader uh, in the Israeli defense systems kind of like you're, you're thrown to the wall. You get out there and you lead. You lead your battalion or you, you lead your group of soldiers. They don't get a lot of support from the top. They just say, you figure it out. And you've got to learn to be a leader in that regard. That's exact leadership skills that makes for a great startup leader. Because you know there's not a playbook about how to build up a, a, an innovative company. And so it's really an amazing thing to see. Just, it blows you away. It's like, that's what I want my kids to grow up to be. You see that as a parent, but then also you understand how important that is to build the Israeli economy as well. So I went on and on, but uh, there are a lot of things that really impacted me that will stay with me uh, for as long as I'm in, uh, in the congressional position I'm in. I'm so touched by, by your response and by your answers and, and by your service. And I wonder if this isn't maybe a, a good time to open it up um, to questions from all the other people who have important questions and things of interest to them. Uh, I, uh, do you have time for that, Congressman? I'm Why hoping. not? We're here. Okay, great. So one of the things I want to mention, I'm going to ask, this is a question that was put in the chat and I'll read it out. But I do want to mention something that over my years of knowing Con uh, first Mayor Stanton and then Congressman Stanton, I have found and seen firsthand how uh, interested you are in helping people and firsthand, not like, you know, we'll look into it, but actually listening and actually changing things for people. So we really appreciate that. Um, myself, All right, thank you for saying that. It's very nice. Um, I, I was telling Karen earlier how um, I see the difference between different people in positions of politics, or I should say positions of government, that's a better word, um, react differently to people. And I, I, I respect you tremendously for how you do it. So thank you. I mean, I love serving in public life. And people think you're crazy to run for political office. I mean, the days are long. Your weekends aren't your own. You probably could make more money doing other things. 
you get yelled at all the time. People question your motives. It can be very difficult on families. And so people wonder why the heck would you run for political office? And my answer is, I can't imagine doing anything else. I love it. I mean, I don't know why I was, I was blessed to be born in a family that was committed to public service and I've got that gene and I can't imagine doing anything else. It's what I love to do. So if you're in that position, uh, you might as well try to get things done and, and, and make a positive difference in people's lives. Thank you. Um, and, and we appreciate that. Cause I, I can, I mean, I know that from the sense of the, uh, clergy perspective of, you know, where you dedicate to others, have less time for family. Um, so I, I know how much that means. Rabbi, everybody us. looks at us and thinks we're crazy for running for office, but I look at clergy and say, that's even crazier. So it's all relative, you know? It's true. <laughs> so here is a comment that came in the chat that was really more about how you can get the vaccine out to others. I'm going to read it. Yeah. I think the government should dispense the COVID vaccine at doctor's offices, pharmacies, and especially at public schools on special days. That way, people in poor areas will have a close place at which to receive their shots. They should be able to call for appointments. I remember getting the Sabin vaccine at a school in PA. Are these ideas possible? Yes. Uh, and, 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 and so now I, this has been a wonderful call, a, a bipartisan discussion, which I love. So, so just take what I'm about to say with the appropriate grain of salt, but my critique, if you, because it's really the state of Arizona that has decided the vaccine distribution policy. If I were to be honest, I think we've probably done a little too much in terms of the mass vaccination sites like at State Farm Stadium, which have been successful in terms of getting a lot of shots of people's arms, but they haven't been as successful in terms of making sure that there's vaccine equity, because that takes a lot more work. Uh, you've got to, as, as was just pointed out, you've really got to dig in and meet people where they're at. Um, if you're really going to be successful in making sure that all of our communities of color receive the vaccine at the same rates. And so you, in some ways, there, there's a trade-off. You know, may, you may not get as many, it's not as efficient as doing a mass vaccination site or drive through or whatever. But at the end of the day, if any community is left behind, we're not doing right by them and we're not doing right by our entire society because you, you can't leave anyone behind, including, by the way, I know this is controversial, but our immigrant community, including our undocumented folks that are living here, I mean, if, if they're not getting it, then they're, then they're at risk and they're putting everyone else at risk. So, so it's truly, we're all in this together when it comes to the vaccine. And so that would be one of, one of my critiques of how the state of Arizona has distributed the vaccine is that there should be more focus in on exactly what that person uh, suggested and in terms of getting out there in the community, which means smaller, you know, it, it's less efficient, but it's more targeted. And I think that should be the approach. Right. And I think, I, I think uh, they're working on that now. That's what you started seeing now. And I know you're, I've, uh, just to put about the vaccine part, I know that your office truly has been tremendous in that. We, we've uh, worked with Matt a little bit. Um, I know he's got a, a lot of ear to Walgreens and uh, we, I've seen your notices. So they've been great. All right, good. I'm glad to hear that. That's great. Um, here is a question that I kind of think segues from what you just mentioned about immigrants. Um, so Izzy, you wanted to ask a question? Yeah, uh, Congressman Stanton, um, just wanted, this is Isidore Lipschitz. Uh, we have kind of crossed paths when you were mayor. You gave a commendation to my son, Brian. He's the helicopter hero. Oh, he, yeah. He, <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, um, putting aside partisan politics. One issue that you haven't mentioned is the problem at the border, um, where people are crossing into the country. And um, since President Biden has come in, he's opened it up and has become more porous than it was before. What is actually going on there? And what is being done on the border? Okay, uh, that's a, certainly a fair question. Uh, it, like, here is the ultimate puzzle that we have to solve. You know, we are, so I believe that in the last administration, border policy was implemented in a way that violated our American values. Uh, so I don't think that, you know, the policies like separating children from their parents at the border 
I, I guess it was effective in terms of, you know, sending a message to people don't come, but that goes against our American values. And, and, and same with, I know there's the remain in Mexico a policy, which puts children and, and, and women in particular at risk uh, during that time. So what we need to do is better investment, for example, in our uh, asylum court system so that people who are seeking political asylum under American law uh, don't stay here for long periods of time before they have their court dates, that they have the opportunity to make a decision more quickly uh, uh, on that. We need to do a better job of investing in uh, ORR facilities, which are the facilities for children, because so many children are crossing uh, without uh, parents, so they don't remain in the border patrol facilities, which are not good facilities for children, but get into uh, facilities where there are proper, uh, proper uh, care. We need to do more to invest in the Northern Triangle countries, which has been devastated the last few years, or been weather events, hurricanes, et cetera. And so there's it, it a reason why so many people are trying to come to America. And, and you know, America has, over the course of many years, gotten away from doing more in foreign support and foreign in, investment. But that's actually good for America, good for America, for our, not only our values, but also policies like, you know, in, making it less of a motivation for people to uh, come to the uh, to the United States uh, of America. So one thing I won't do is demonize immigrants or demonize people who seek uh, uh, seek political asylum. We need to do this in a in a, in a way where we maintain uh, border security. We also uh, properly follow American uh, asylum uh, laws, and we do it in a way that really maintains American values. Uh, and I just don't think that what was done previously really was consistent with America, you know, our values as, uh, as Americans and as human beings. But are we implementing those values now? Um, I, I, my family and I are immigrants. It took us eight years to get status here. Um, and I'm not saying that everyone should spend eight years, but if there's a problem, if there's a problem with the uh, immigration laws, truly the laws should be uh, uh, amended. Um, that it, it just, if people are just pouring through the borders, your whole um, uh, premise of infrastructure is going to be uh, um, completely wrong because you're going to have hundreds of thousands of additional people that are unaccounted for. I'm not. Uh, not in favor of immigration, but I'm in favor of illegal immigration. In other words, you can come to the country, but the, the, the U.S. should know who's crossing that border. The, the, the same way as if you fly in to New York or Los Angeles or something like that, they go through your passport, they ask you all the stuff, yet on the border, you can just walk across. The current situation, you should know, uh, is mostly people coming to border checkpoints. So they are coming through the, through the, the official channels. So they're just seeking political asylum. So the of question course. is, what do you do with someone seeking political asylum? My point is uh, they should have, you know, uh, uh, we should be aware of, of where they are, who their sponsor is in the United States. We should have a quick hearing. So that way they're not here for a long period of time before we have some adjudication as to their status so they're not you know they're not kind of here in no man's land and that's going to take a little more investment in the asylum uh, courts but in terms of changes to american law look i've i'm on judiciary committee we are we have voted and the and the house of representatives has voted for the dream act to 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 take our the immigrants particularly dreamers and allow them to have a path to citizenship i believe that's consistent with american values obviously i hope and pray that that bill gets a hearing uh, before the United States Senate. And I do support comprehensive immigration reform, very similar to what Senator McCain and Senator Flake supported uh, a decade or so ago, uh, that we take people out of the shadows and fully into the American economy, and we have border security. Now, I want to make sure it's clear, uh, I, I don't think a wall is good public policy. I do think more technology, which is, which is actually more effective, more efficient, and is less of an environmental disaster, because building a wall across uh, 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 the southern border is is uh, very bad for the environment, and, and you can see the pictures and, and read about the impact. And I actually think we can do this in a much smarter and more efficient way 
by using very smart uh, uh, technology, infrared cameras and things like that, where we could be more efficient with our resources. Thank, thank you for your thank you for addressing the issue. Yes, yeah, I tell your son I said hello, and uh, he's still a hero in my book. That doesn't that never changes. Thank you, thank you, thank, thank you for addressing that. Just so you know, you have a comment in the uh, chat that says you should run for governor, and I don't know if you've ever addressed if that's in your sights. But uh, this is not a political call. I want to I want to <laughs> I want to keep consistent. Uh, we'll have a political call later on another another time. Oh, I got you. All right, uh, George Weiss wanted to. Uh, Sure. I didn't know he was on the call. Yeah. Hello, Greg. Hey, How are you, friend? I am. I am well. Thank you, first of all, for your great comments, and thank you for spending the time with Smile on Seniors, which probably does more with less than any organization I know. What the rabbi does, and the people who volunteers, and uh, you know, just do a tremendous job. So, thank you for for giving us the time, and and just kind of a one comment, and, and then a question. Um, Karen Nagel said it so eloquently as a rabbi did, uh, you have tremendous passion for not just our state, but our community. Um, and having known you and worked alongside you when you were back at city council, I think you are such a good congressman, a member of Congress, because of that passion, walking the streets, helping fix things. There was no politics. It was a matter of just getting things done. And the city council person is the closest to the people and so many assisted living and independent living areas in your district when you served, as well as Mayor Phoenix. And, and that really shows. Um, but you have tremendous passion as you showed in Israel, as you mentioned. Um, you don't just wear Israel on your sleeve, but it's in your heart. And, and I know that, and that's so important. So thank you for that. And, and thank you for, for being in the arena. Um, the only comment I wanna ask and throw out, and it's important to this community, um, you know, COVID as we know, struck really hard in nursing homes, assisted living, independent livings, where the rabbi spent so much of his time and was such a consoling factor to so many people who were suffering from either COVID or other, other uh, issues. And there's a concept of an innovative COVID-19 rapid response teams that was not used by the state and county, because that's who did the implementation was the state and county. Um, feds were trying to get the resources out there. But it's something to think about. Hopefully, we're coming out of, of the dark um, into the light, but we never know what's ahead. Um, and I hope you will look at uh, what are these rapid response teams, an innovative plan to put people, doctors and nurses into assisted living, into nursing homes, which are overwhelmed because they don't have enough personnel to begin with. They don't have the resources. They don't have the knowledge. And as soon as there is a COVID a site, um, a sighting, um, that we send in the resources to those places because that's where the death occurs. That's where the most threat is. And sadly, the state and county did not want to put that kind of plan into implementation, but it's something I hope you will look at for the future. For All right. I, well, first off, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I think you're 100% right. Look, uh, my general analysis is that as a country and as a state, we did not handle this virus very well. Dr. Burks, if you saw her on TV the other day, said um, we probably could have been closer to 100,000 100, deaths in America if we had handled this a lot more strategically, doing exactly what you just described, being much more strategic with our resources. And we'll look back and look at what happened in our uh, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, et cetera. And um, we'll look back with regret. And I hope and pray we learn lessons uh, for the future. And as you're seeing what happened with the uh, New York governor, this is a bipartisan mistakes that were made, tragic mistakes that were um, uh, that were made. We need to do so much more testing of both people living in the facilities and staff. And they, they did not provide special resources and help. And having the, you're right, putting doctors right on site, they are much more regularly to oversee it. It would have been uh, a strategic, uh, very smart and strategic thing to um, uh, uh, to do. And there was sadly so many unnecessary deaths uh, that occurred uh, as a result of that poor uh, decision-making. By the way, the other thing we never did, George, is we never really implemented contact tracing in America ever, really. And at the beginning of this pandemic, we were told wear a mask, social distance, and we've got to really do contact tracing. 
and the countries that were much more successful than us in keeping the death tolls down, New Zealand and, 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 and a lot of the Asian countries, one, one consistent thing is that their leadership really implemented real contact tracing much earlier in the, uh, in the process. Because once you had community spread, you really can't do contact tracing. And we lost that battle pretty early on. And then uh, we're, we're, we're gonna pay the price. Some people have sadly paid the ultimate price as a result of that poor decision-making. Well, we're honored to have you here and we're all grateful and thankful that you're in Congress representing us. And it means a lot to, to us and, and keep that passion that you've always had. Well, I'm, I'm always glad to, to uh, appear before Smile on Seniors Thank you. because George, None of us are getting any younger. So when I reach the uh, age, I want to make sure maybe, maybe they'll have me someday. That's, so I want to make sure this organization line. stays as strong as possible. That's so your base is there, Congressman. Absolutely. <laughs> do you have time for one more question? One more. Let's do it. Yeah. All right. Stan and Betty. Yeah, I, I just wanted to ask, I'm, I'm in New York. Our Congressman is Anthony Delgado uh, from uh, our, our area. And I'm just curious, will I ever live to see compromise in Congress? I remember, I'm, I'm old enough to remember when they would fight like hell in Congress and then go out for drinks and dinner. Now they don't even talk to each other. I mean, what, where are we? Is there any chance of this ever happening? Okay, fair question. First, fortunately, you're a young man, so you are going to live long enough to, uh, to see compromise back in, uh, in Congress. And I should say, Anthony Delgado. I love the guy. Uh, so you're, you're you're in upstate New York then, right? Yes, yes, yes. right. How's All right. Been? Now I'll tell you why I love him. Number one, uh, I love his personality, his uh, voting record. But as George can attest, I love basketball. <laughs> and so Anthony Delgado played Division One college basketball at right. Colgate University, which means. He's the best basketball player in Congress right now. And so when we put, when we can get together once again, hopefully in the near future and, and uh, play our pickup basketball games, uh, there's a congressional gym. You better believe that I love making Anthony my number one draft pick uh, whenever I play. He's an awesome, uh, awesome guy. Uh, and I really love him. So in, in all serious. Okay. On the issue of uh, partisanship and politics, uh, or, or lack of bipartisanship. First, I should say, you know, look, there's, you, you watch TV a lot. And so the people you see on TV, whether you watch MSNBC or Fox News, they tend to be the most bombastic people and say the most outrageous things. And, uh, and, and, and sadly, that gets rewarded in our political system in terms of like political don donations. I mean, um, Marjorie Taylor Greene, uh, who, if you follow politics, you know, is probably the most bombastic member of Congress these days, and had said some and said some really uh, prejudicial things, and so we removed her from her committees. So she's not a she's not a, a real player in Congress when it when it comes to public policy. But because she's become so famous, she raised over three million dollars in one quarter, which is which is an unbelievable uh, amount of money, as because she's on. TV all the time. And so unfortunately, the kind of the political incentive systems that we set up currently, both on the left and the right, you know, you want to become famous. Uh, and if you become famous, uh, the only way to become famous is by saying outrageous, bombastic things. And, you know, boring members of Congress like me, and I happily put myself in the, the boring uh, category who are just focused in on trying to get things done and uh, support the people of my community, bring projects, uh, important infrastructure projects back to my uh, community, work in a bipartisan way to support Israel, for example. You know, that's kind of the good blocking and tackling of Congress. We toil away in relative anonymity uh, in, in the larger Washington uh, uh, picture. I don't know what to say about it other than I, I'm gonna try to continue to model good behavior. When I say good behavior, it's just be a normal person, like, you know, work in a bipartisan way when you can, if it, if it really helps you get things done, um, don't say bombastic things uh, try to be supportive of your, of your colleagues. And, and I'll try to, you know, I, I'm one of the few Democrats who got endorsed by the uh, uh, National Chamber of Commerce, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce last time around, specifically because they viewed me as a, a member that in good faith does work, uh, does work across the aisle. And they really wanted to, they probably don't love everything I voted for, but they really want to encourage that sort of congressional behavior. And so I'm going to continue to do my part. 
which probably means I won't be asked to be interviewed on national television very much because I don't really say things that will increase ratings on the various political uh, TV shows. I always felt that a law was a good law if I was a Democrat and you were a Republican and both of us weren't happy with the law, then the law was probably a good compromise. Yeah, and unfortunately, I think uh, what gets rewarded these days is by bragging about your unwillingness to compromise, yeah, yeah. Uh, as opposed to exactly what you described. Fight for your, you know, publicly state your position, what you believe in, but then tell your constituents, I still have to cut a deal. I still, you know, at the end of the day, we need the votes to get things done. And I, I would argue that on many, many issues, that, that attitude is uh, unfortunately uh, uh, lost. I have to tell you one thing about uh, Congressman Delgado. He was in a debate, and they were brought, and the uh, the uh, recum, uh, recurring senators brought up this fact that uh, how would you you you're you're anti-Israel, right? And he I'm said, yeah, and that he's anti-Semitic. And he said, wait a minute, my wife is Jewish, my daughters go to Hebrew school, so. That's all I'm going to say. Now, the interesting thing is our son went to camp with his wife. All so right, I'm gonna, what I'm going to jump in because I know that uh, Congressman Stanton's time is very precious. And I know he has another meeting in about a couple in three or four minutes. So I wanted to just thank you so very much. And I do want to just um, reiterate that his office is very, very open. Um, and always there to help. So if you do have a question for him, I know that they would address that. Um, if it wasn't addressed today, uh, definitely reach out through their website. And then Congressman Sands, if you just wanted to close out or sh share a last uh, comments or any statement. Well, I'm only gonna say this, like I know a lot of people on this call are supporters of Israel. So thank you for doing that. If you ever think the American political system is really messed up, just look at the Israeli political system. They can't, <laughs> I think they're about to have their fifth election or something for, for the leadership of the country, which I shouldn't joke about because it is so important that, uh, that we get stability, uh, stability there, but it probably becomes even more important that uh, America you know, makes it uh, absolutely clear uh, that how important that relationship uh, is because we can't have any of their uh, adversaries in the region take advantage of their political instability as they're going through maybe their fifth election uh, uh, right now. Uh, I did, what not, I'll show you how, when we were there in 2019, it was when it was the final, the vote was coming up between Gans and, uh, and, and Netanyahu and it was super, super uh, close. All right, I didn't really come prepared with any final remarks other than to say, <laughs> uh, great to see everybody. And yeah, please take advantage of my office, whether it has to do with any things we talked about today or any other issues that you have, um, you know, I, uh, I've got a great team that was, is there to uh, serve. And then if anything I said really bothered you uh, or you don't like, feel free to reach out and send me an email or call me because I want to hear your perspective as well. I always, I always find I do my best leading by actually listening and, and sometimes even changing a position because I've heard a perspective that I hadn't really thought of. And, uh, and that actually does occur. Thank you, and, and thank you for that. That's I, Helen I has her hand up. Uh, Helen, is it a quick one? Let's see. Hold on. Hold on. We got to unmute you, Helen. There you go. I said I just wanted to say that I think you're terrific, and you need to give lessons to the other politicians about how to be articulate and think about what they're working for other than themselves. Uh, we have a long way to go, I think, in Congress. It's very unfortunate. Very I, will, unfortunate. I don't want to give you some hope. Please. I mentioned how boring I am earlier, but the vast majority of Congress is actually boring people that do want to work together. You just probably don't hear about those people, but behind the scenes, there is a lot more bipartisanship that goes on. It just doesn't get, and we're not asking for any coverage, but the truth is that um, there's only so many bombastic members that, that go on these various TV shows. The, there's, there's 435 of us, and the vast majority do get along and are trying to get the right thing done. Well, barely. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, have a great one. Thank you, Thank Rabbi. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Karen and uh, George. Great to see everybody, uh, and uh, look forward to working with you. Let's do it again soon. Yes, thank you again. Take care. Nice to bye see bye. you again.